And now we look at blogging. Now, blogging to me is one of the best platforms in any part of social media. You have the versatility to put pictures, video, lots of words, a couple of words, embed MP3s. You're really only held back by your imagination because a blog is very much a blank slate. And to me, that's what makes it so versatile, so powerful. And, you know, it's telling that blogging was around before the likes of Friend Reunited, Bebo and MySpace, and the odds are that once, you know, perhaps even Twitter and Facebook have gone away, that blogging will still be there. It's just it's so versatile and gives you so many options. But for those who aren't 100% sure, you know, what a blog is, you know, what is it? And let's just have a quick look at an overview of blogging. But blogging, as opposed to most web pages, is a lot more informal. It's a lot more friendly. It's not necessarily casual, but it's more human and has more of a personality to it. And all of this, you know, makes it something that people can relate to instead of just looking at, you know, huffy, stuffy, formal so normal web pages, you know, a blog allows you to have a bit more character and a bit more space and also, to be fair, a bit more fun. Now, there's more than one type of blog and, you know, from the small individual to the large corporation. And, you know, traditionally they were set up by individuals, you know, talking about a hobby or something they had a passion in. And then companies got in in the act and started doing the same thing. You know, talking about their passion, which is their company, obviously. And that's something that now you see companies having numerous blogs. You know, you can have companies where individual departments all have their own blog, for example. And you know, this is a good thing because done properly, you know, a blog offers insight. You know, it's a chance to answer questions and it can give you a better feel for a company and, and how it works. And there's a number of types of blogs, you know, there's fashion blogs, politics blogs, there's blogs more or less by video that are just pictures. You know, there's a lot of variety and I know that sounds like I'm banging on a drum here by mentioning variety time and time again, but you know, it is a very good thing. You know, there's a lot you can do with it. There's a lot of options and, you know, it's one of these things if you think, oh, well, is social media or digital engagement for us? Start with a blog and you won't be you know, too long in finding out. Now, obviously, as with all things in social media, there's opportunities and threats to this. And, you know, the, the very obvious ones are in the fields of research. You know, you can build up a loyal following of bloggers, you know, people who come back on a regular basis to see what's being said in your blog. And they will engage, they will interact, and they can then tell you what they like or equally what they don't like. And that's not just about blog posts. They'll tell you what they like about your company or about your products. And at the same time, you know, this allows you to talk about these things, to even talk about trends in your industry and perhaps even look like the big man by talking about the industry as a whole. You know, that sets you up above that of being just a sort of pundit. You know, that makes you look like, you know, a real expert in your field if you're willing to tackle the broader issues affecting everyone. But obviously, it's not all just plain sailing and putting your opinion out there. At the same time, you have to remember that while many bloggers write with the best of intentions, they're not necessarily the experts they think they are or even that they just believe to be. Because at the end of the day, there's no course for blogging authenticity. There's no... You don't have to have a degree in a subject before you're allowed to have a blog. So you'll bear that in mind when peeping to, when, when speaking to people that they may not be all they claim to be. But with a bit of research, it's easy enough to find out who who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. There's also you know similarly you know there's great marketing opportunities you know in that you can build a relationship, you can build up brand ambassadors, you know people that will stick up for you not just on your own blog but elsewhere, and you know that sort of loyal customer base you really can't go wrong with, and you know the downside to this is that you you want to make sure you're dealing with people who are on brand message for you. Because you may think it's, you know, your brand is one thing, but the general public may see it as another. So you've got to make sure you're engaging properly, and not just with the right people, but also with the right tone of voice too. 
And for some companies, there's equally great support opportunities. You know, if you want to say to people, you know, we have a help desk, but you know, get in touch via email, tell us what your problems are, and we'll post solutions here. You can use your blog for that. You can have a blog to talk about the top 10 calls made to your help desk, or, you know, the top 10 inquiries made about your product. And again, it's very simple to put that information online, and then that saves people actually getting in touch via the phone. That doesn't mean you can suddenly get rid of all your support staff or customer service teams though because at the end of the day some people will like to talk to humans at the end of a phone, some people won't be able to find the information that they need online and some people just may not be that comfortable sharing you know, their, their, their issue or their problem in online. I mean, there's, there's a reason the Samaritans is still a phone service. So, you know, think of it that way that yes, you can migrate a lot of telephone calls or a lot of issues to an online system but at the end of the day you still need a phone system as well in place and again you know all of blogging like all of social social media is about showing how good you are about showing how knowledgeable you are about showing how insightful you are and you know every time you do that people will see that you believe your product is good and they'll have a chance to see for themselves if your product is any good and this is a great thing because at the end of the day the more people like your products, the more they're likely to buy them, the more they're going to say, yeah, that's what I want, I'll, I'm, I'm having some of that. And that can only be a good thing. But again, you need to make sure you're doing it in the right way. If you're too over the top or if you're too pushy, then you'll be putting people off. And the best way to think of it is, think of it like being at a party. If you meet someone at a party and all the conversation is about them, if they just go, me, 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 you're quite fed up with them. You know, but if they tell you something interesting and then it's a natural conversation between you, that works so, so much better. And you'll be more interested in them as well because they haven't been pushy, they haven't been arrogant, they haven't put you off. So you know, think of online in the same way. You can also develop, you can develop communities, you know, you can develop, you could even develop new products, you know, this ties in with marketing to an extent. And, you know, you can just build relationships and, you know, you can share information from your company. But, you know, bear in mind that the more you share, you know, it's not just your fans that will see that, it can be your competitors too. Now, blogging is no longer a fad. And over the next couple of slides, we're just going to look at that to sort of stress that point. You know, yes, there are blogs in the consumer sector. There are blogs in B2B. There are blogs in technology, finance, healthcare, and all across the UK. So it's well worth considering that the odds are, no matter what sector you're in, there's a blog there for you. Or there's blogs being written about that sector that you can engage with and perhaps even go on to do your own. Now, obviously, corporate blogging is the main reason for talking here. And it all comes down to a very simple thing. Once you've decided that we're going to do a blog, you know, the first question you're going to face is, what do we do? Do we host it ourselves or do we let someone else host it? Do we host it out there in the cloud, so to speak? And what you have to think is, well, what's the pros and cons of both? And if you host it remotely, you know, if you use something like blogger.com, you know, the, the Google blogging service, you know, it's easy. You know, life is made very easy for you with it in that, you know, you, you just do your input. You know, very often it's just like updating a Microsoft Word document and, it's, uh, and off you go. But at the same time, you're limited in customization. You might not get all the ana analytics that you want. And, you know, there's just that feeling of it not being fully yours because if you're hosting it elsewhere and that site goes down, then you, if you've not backed stuff up, then you've lost everything. If you host it yourself, you can pretty much do what you want. You know, at the end of the day, it's yours to customise, to tinker with, to create, to change, and you're not beholden to anyone. So that can make that so more appealing for many people. Uh, there's downsides, of course, in that it's not free. You have to look after it. Your IT team have to make sure it's secure. It's not a backdoor to the rest of your company's servers. And things that you just consider as you would with a website and other things that would be connected to the outside world. But if you do do it to the do it yourself and you know you, you can't just go right we've got a blog let's put some words down and that's us. There are little tweaks you can do 
that make it stand out so so much more from the crowd and there are millions of blogs out there the odds are that in your sector there's even hundreds so you you want to compete and capture people's time and you know, things you can do to make this process a lot simpler are to have a nice blog avatar a tag cloud a blog role a contact page and an about page and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about each of these a blog avatar for example is just an icon or a picture that lets people identify you now very often corporations will just put a corporate logo up or a corporate image up and that's fine you know that's perfectly acceptable but you know if you're going to an event you know it may be that you miss out seeing someone or recognizing someone because they haven't had a proper picture next to their blog so it may be an idea in that sense then to you know, perhaps have a picture of someone wearing you know a polo shirt or something with a corporate logo on it or standing next to a corporate logo you know the logo being provided by a pop-up banner or a logo outside the building or so on if you can try and combine a face and a logo you know that can give you the best possible benefits and the tag is also something that helps you identify your content on a blog and it may seem you know you're thinking well hang on i just write a blog and that's it no sorry you know, you have to give it a little bit more structure and that you have to give it tags and you can also give it categories. And this is a good thing because the more identifiable your content is, the easier it is for people to find similar content on your blog, stay on your blog and read more. And also there's benefits there for search engines. You know, they'll go right, they can see what this blog is about. They can see what the content's about. And that plays a, a, a part. And, you know, you, many people will have seen this sort of thing when they look at blogs, they'll have seen this tag cloud. And you do, the idea here is that the more often something is tagged, the more popular something is, the larger the text. And what's happening here on this one is that marketing, digital, social and advertising are all quite big words. So you can see there that those must be you know, very important or there must be a lot of them in that site and you would click on one of those and see all of the blog post tagged marketing, for example. Here's another example of it here with White Mackay's Master Blender and as you can see there, you know, whiskey shops and whiskey play a, a large role on that site and if you click on one of those, you see all the blog, po all the blog posts even. It's sorry for thinking about blagging when thinking about whiskey it, you would see all the blog posts that talk about whiskey or whiskey shops now away from tag clouds an about page is a very essential but sadly still an underused part of blog sites these days and all it can have it's not a lot of work you know it just has to say what the page is about who the page is by you know where it's being blogged from and you know in essence what you're about and what the blog is about and you can add more details if you want you can add contact details you can add details about the actual blog you can say this blog gets x amount of views it's visited by x and x countries and again that's information that can be very useful to people trying to get in touch with you or work out if your blog is a blog they want to do business with of course you have to bear in mind then that if you do put that out there then if you have competitors they can also see that information so it's something to bear in mind but you know at the very least an about page should have a picture a bit of detail and contact details in case you don't have them anywhere else on your site now a blog role seems very old-fashioned to many but it's still a very nice thing to have and this basically is a list to the side of your page showing off who you think is worth keeping in touch with so if it's a whiskey site you could list all the whiskey blogs or you could list whiskey companies that have a blog if it's a golfing course you could have local bloggers you could also have golfing bloggers you know again it ties back to this idea of there's blogs for everyone now so you know it's nice to share the love and just as people see that you're mentioning them and crediting them they may do the same to you and again that increases your awareness out there that increases the chances of people stumbling across your site and that's a very very good thing to have of course and if you don't have it on your about page a very very good thing to have is a contact page some contact details if you want to be completely thorough you can have contact details on both and why do you want contact details well if you're individual bloggers it's a good thing to have 
just so that people can get in touch perhaps to offer you something to review or to talk to you about your site or to say something they may not feel completely comfortable just saying in a comment section. If you're a company, you want to make sure people can get in touch to tell you what they're thinking of your products and so on. I mean, at the end of the day, you're doing this for a purpose and that purpose isn't just to justify your job. That purpose is to help your company and to make your company better. So make sure that you're giving details out there that let people get in touch with you and go, saw your company did this or love your company doing this or has your company thought about doing something else? And, you know, again, it's this idea of making it engaging, making it two-way. It's not just you dictating to people. And there's a number of ways of you can give people a chance to get in touch with you. You know, you can have a graphic with an email address, you can have a contact form, or you can even try something that's a, a bit old school now, but, you know, lots of people still do it. You know, instead of having at and, you know, full stops in your email address, have hello at at in capital letters and dot for dots later on or you can even also put some spacing in the actual words though to be fair you know a lot of spam bots these days you know the, the pieces of software that are just go and troll for email addresses are getting better and better at spotting this sort of thing and dealing with it but now that you know you what you want on your blog well now you know, have an idea for your framework you have to think about what you're going to put on it you know, what, is it just going to be day-to-day -day stuff? Is it going to be once-a-week information? Is it going to be instructional? Is it going to be you reviewing items? What is it going to be? I mean, obviously, the best blogs out there have a mix of content. You know, they will have, you know, some how-to stuff. You know, how to do this, how to do that. They will have some reviews. They will have some insight. And again, you just have to sit down and work out how much time you can give your blog and how often your content's going to be. And one of the best things for that is a blog calendar. This is what you, quite simply you can do it with a pen and a piece of paper. And we'll show an example shortly. But it's where you sit down and work out when you want to blog. And, you know, you can sit down with a piece of paper and just go 1 to 28, 1 to 30, 1 to 31, depending on which month it is. And go, right, we're blogging here, we're blogging here, we're blogging here, we're blogging here. Okay, we've got a product launch on this day, or we've got a key, this is a key date, should we have a blog in around that? Quickly, you can fill in the blanks and, and make it work for you. And what you may even want to do is have, right, every Monday we will blog about this. Every Wednesday we will blog about this. And build up a theme, so that when people come back to your site every Monday, they know what they're getting. When they come back every Wednesday, they have an idea of what they're going to get. Now, if you're using WordPress, which is for many the preferred blogging platform, you can get a plugin called an editorial calendar, which, as you can see there, is pretty much just a straightforward calendar with you know, the, the blog post topic put in at the top. Now, it can either be you've written the full blog post in advance or you've just put the, the bare bones detail in there so that you know, right, okay, that's what we're writing on that day, that's what we're writing on that day, and off we go. It can be a very, very useful tool. Other forms of editorial calendar can look like this. And again, you, you'll see it sticking fairly rigidly to the idea of calendar. In that, you know, Monday you go, okay, we're going to tweet. We've got a Facebook update. We've got something for YouTube. And that WordPress logo tells us we're going to blog. On Sunday, we're just going to tweet and put something on Pinterest. On Tuesday, we'll tweet. We'll be on WordPress, Facebook, and Google+. You, know, you can see there just from the icons of what you know what platforms are being visited. However, the downside to that is that it doesn't actually tell you anything. You know, at least when you look at the WordPress plugin, you can see what you know is going to be spoken about. This doesn't give you any of that sort of functionality, though it is very pretty to look at, admittedly. One that can be easily done with a spreadsheet is something along these lines. And this was a hypothetical one created for uh, a whiskey brand. And if you look there, you'll see along the top, you've got your Sunday to Saturday. And down the side, you've got your dates. You know, you've got the 15th, you've got the 22nd, you've got 29th of January, and then going into February. And for obvious reasons, I've kept these blank. <coughs> Pardon me. What you'll also see down the side is that there's a space for Facebook. And if you look at the second sort of table you'll see that there's Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn and basically all that means is each week you could go along and say right on Sunday the 15th we're going to do cooking with whiskey but in there you could actually put 
what's going to be getting made you know is it whiskey with haggis is it a whiskey dessert is it whiskey with salmon by putting in the bare bones detail you can then look at that at a glance and go right we're doing that there we're doing that there we're doing that there we've got gaps here what can we find and again similarly you get facebook youtube and linkedin there and you could add others if you wanted you know and you could put in you know just a top line idea of what your facebook post is going to be what your youtube post is going to be if you're having one and what you're putting on linkedin and again you know, very much i'm no fan of spreadsheets myself but you can very much look at that and get a glimpse an idea of a week's activity or what's going to be done the, the downside is that you need someone to stay on top of that and keep on top of it making sure it's updated it's filled in and the content is actually done of course events can be great for blogging because before you go to an event you can write about it when you're there you can speak about it and afterwards you can review it so that's one simple event giving you at least three pieces of blogging and you can mention lots of people and have people come to visit their blog to see what you've said about them or what pictures you've included and so on. So, you know, if you if you do go to events or you host events, there's certainly something that's worth considering. And, you know, it doesn't need to just be straightforward conferences and exhibitions. If you're doing a, a report into a sector, that's worth looking at as well because that can easily play a part. But how to speak when you're doing this these blogs and keep it simple is the very honest and direct tip there you know use your keywords as well you know we speak a lot about search engine optimization and how you should know what your keywords for your company are and yes this is where they play a key role because the odds are your blog will be updated more often than any other part of your site so make sure your keywords are in there on a regular basis but you don't go overboard you know perhaps four seven at the most you know, have per hundred words, have them in there, you know, try and have them in hyperlinks. Fairly straightforward stuff to anyone who's even looked at some sites online. And again, you know, other tips that are handy, you know, be active. You know, people like to read copy that's engaging and active copy is always more engaging than anything that's a bit more passive. You know, similarly, using you and we is a great way of just bringing an audience into your blog posts. Even a simple question at the end of what do you think? Or here we go. You know, things that just remind people that you are all in this together, that it's a two-way process, that it's an engagement. And, you know, if possible, you know, give examples. You know, if you're talking about how a product was, get make it very personable. Speak about how someone used it or show how someone used it. Don't just maintain a distance and be very, you know, neutral about it. You know, give opinion. Pe people like opinion. It's one of the main reasons they go into blogs, and that's what they're looking for. You know, if they want to just very observer neutral material, they can get that from a million places. But you know, a blog is meant to have some personality, a bit of zing, and a bit of passion behind it. And again, you know, this just ties into what we've just been saying. You know, be genuine be intelligent, be direct. And again, there's benefits offline for this as well because if you can cut the rubbish out of your online writing, the odds are that you'll cut your rubbish out of your offline writing as well. So just build up consistency, tone, personality. These are all things that will stand you in very good stead. But of course, be authentic. Don't be saying stuff just for the sake of it or to get the traffic because the odds are the next time you're out and about, you know, someone may call you up and what you've said or... If you, you know, the press know you have a blog, they may pick up in your comments. And if you don't really mean them, that can put everyone in a bad light. Now, blogs aren't just about you or whoever is writing your blog. They're also about comments. And in this day and age, you know, comments come in a variety of shapes and sizes. There's the comments that are left on your blog where you should, of course, engage back, respond, answer any queries and so on. But there's also comments that can be left for you on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. You know, pe people will leave comments all over the place now. And you have to make sure you're monitoring for them and seeing what people are saying. Now, what pl pl platforms? What platforms are actually worth considering? WordPress is the one that I champion very often. I believe it's very simple. Anyone who's used Microsoft Word can use a WordPress blog and 
it makes it an absolute breeze. You know, there, there are two forms of WordPress. There's WordPress.com and WordPress.org, and we'll touch on them both. And, you know, it, the beauty is it can be as complicated or as easy as you want. You know, you can set it up and it does everything for you. You know, you see there, you just literally go to WordPress.com, you sign up, and then you'll see not just far from sign up, there's a support button as well and you go on that and it tells you everything i mean there's no need for some sort of walkthrough video here or any sort of detail like that because this really does tell you everything you know you say get started and it will give you it from the most basic basic sort of advice to you know up to the more top level stuff and you know you, there's no harm in spending a wee half hour or a couple of hours depending on your time you know just sitting reading and learning to see what actually works for you away from wordpress.com is wordpress.org and it's you know as we've said you know it's it's the same platform you know it looks the same the only difference being is that one is downloadable you know one gives you more control and one is on someone else's site and that's just to reiterate what the differences are. You know, WordPress.com is hosted. You don't download anything. You know, WordPress.org is free and you have a lot more control with it. You know, the, the majority of corporate blogs these days that use WordPress have it embedded on their own sites because it means they have all the control while still having all the friendly functionality of WordPress. It's not the only platform, mind you. There's Blogger.com, which is brought to you by Google. And... It has a very familiar template. If you've seen one blogger site, you've probably seen the vast majority because it's not as you know, customizable. You can't play about with it and tinker with it as much as you can with WordPress. But many people still like it because it's you know once you're started, you're up and running and that's it. There's no need to tinker. You don't want to play about. You just want something just to do words and pictures. Off you go. Another site that lets you just do words and pictures at a very simple level is Posterous. And the idea behind this was that people didn't always want, you know, something like Blogger, but at the same time, they didn't necessarily want to be on something like WordPress, you know, and tinkering with huge design elements and so on. So Posterous is a halfway house where you send an email and whatever is in the body of the text that's your blog post your heading is your subject in your email and off you go it's very simple to do it means you can do it from anywhere you can do it from a blackberry you can do it from an iphone you can do anything that allows you to do email you can do a posterous blog post from which makes it quite good for a lot of people other people like it for a toy and then move into something more advanced but you know if you do just want to dabble a little bit there's no harm in having a look at it now, obviously, you, you blogging yourself is only part of the whole story because, as we've said before, you know there's hundreds of bloggers out there in every field and you want to find them, you want to engage with them. It's all about being in a community. So you have to make sure that you're maximising your time in this community by speaking to others, by engaging with others, by being involved with others. And again, this comes back to this idea of knowing what your keywords are knowing what your company stands for so that at the end of the day you can say this is what we're about let's go and find people who are also about this you know let's look at our competition who are also about this and you know quite simple to do and you know you, you can go right let's monitor these and see how we get on and you know seo is going to be essential in all of this you don't need to be you know an expert like the guys at hobo or so on for it but at the same time it's nice that if you have a bit of seo knowledge even some basics even if you've just tinkered with google adwords keyword tool just to see what you can do with it just to see what people are saying about you and once you've found your keywords you know work out the ones that are important to you because at the end of the day you you'll probably have at least half a dozen keywords at the most simple level you could have hundreds eventually but Work out which ones are important to you and then know that that's what you're aiming towards. Know that that's the words that you're intending to mention in your blog post as you move forward. And again, you know, use your keywords to then go and find bloggers. You know, use Google Blog Search, Technorati, Ice Rocket, you know, even just simple searches on even Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. 
you know, you, you put in your key, your keywords and add blog to it or blogger and you will get some good and interesting results that will at least 80% of the time be relevant to you. But having said that, if you don't necessarily have the time or the inclination to go and find these people yourself, others can do it for you. You know, Any good PR or social media service these days will say to you, you know, for a fee, they'll go and find you a bunch of bloggers for you to engage with. But obviously, not all bloggers are born equal. You know, so, some bloggers will have lots of traffic. Some bloggers won't have a lot of traffic. But what you have to work out is how influential they are and what does it come down to? You know, is it purely about the numbers they get on their site or as the example says there, you know, is it about the quality or the, you know, the, the audience that that blog has that works best for you? And there's, there's simple ways of determining influence. I mean, when, as you look about blogs, you'll see yourself how many people are speaking about a blog and that will give you an idea of, you know, if everyone mentions John Smith's blog, then the odds are John Smith's blog is fairly influential and a fairly useful site to be on. But there are other ways of doing it as well. And you can use sites like Technorati to do it. And there are some very simple steps to find an authority link for any blog you want to put in. And, you know, again, this will give you an idea of who's more important. You might look at one blog, think it's fantastic, and that's the blog you should be doing business with, only for you to discover that it's not really ranking that well. You know, it's not really as important as you thought. So you then have to evaluate, is it still worth you investing some time in it? Or do you just want to give up and deal with other blogs instead? But obviously, once you've found these bloggers, you have to think, well, how am I going to engage with them? What am I going to do with them? And because ultimately, if you get in touch with a blogger, you're doing so because you want them to mention you and you know, perhaps also ultimately drive traffic back to your site. So the, the, with that key thought in mind, you have to work out how you're going to get in touch with them. And indeed, you have to watch out to see if someone is you know, approachable in the first place. Many of the beauty bloggers, for example, have really good guidelines on most of their sites saying, yes, approach me if you're a PR company or don't approach me if you're a PR company or approach me using just this form or approach me via Twitter. You know, it's a very almost professional way of doing it, but it's a very good way of doing it because it makes life a lot simpler for other people. But how, how can you work out if someone is of use to you or approachable? Quite simply, read their posts. There's no greater thing than human involvement still. I mean, for all you can look at technorati and blog searches and so on, you have to bear in mind that the best judgment of a blog being of any use to you to engage with is your own two eyes looking at it. And if you have a look at what's being said in their blog, you'll see if they talk about reviews, they'll see if they talk about you, they'll see if they talk about your competitors, they'll see if they like having you know, people pitch things to them. And from there, you can evaluate and decide whether or not they are worth getting in touch with. Now, one thing, obviously, to bear in mind, and again, it's why your homework is so essential in all of this, is to consider that just because this is someone's hobby or something they may do as an aside to their day job, that doesn't mean they don't know a lot about it. They may be very, very knowledgeable. For all you know, they may be running their blog actually as a full-time business. And you have to consider that even though it may be something you go, but surely not, that yes, it may well be the case. You know, there, there are beauty bloggers who run their blogs as full-time businesses. And if you want to get them to write on your blog or give you a mention, they will charge you for that. And that's because they're in a position to do so because they know the audience, they know the traffic that they'll drive and they know what they will do. So you know, consider these things in mind when you are pitching. And make sure you're pitching with something interesting, something good, something relevant. You know, as, as you would when approaching a journalist, you know, be open, be honest, provide further information. One thing just to make sure, though, is, you know, don't include five megabyte picture files or video files. You know, make sure that you're, you're giving them enough details to sort of tease them, you know, to, to get them to bite the hook, so to speak, and then give them links to further information so that if they want pictures, 
they can go and download them. They want to watch a video, they can click a link and do it because nothing's going to antagonize someone more than them having to download a 20 meg file over an iPhone 3G connection, for example. You know, just bear in mind, you know, how other people may be accessing their data. And always, you know, be straight, be upfront, be honest. You know, as it says there, you know, if you're wanting someone to write a review, state if you work for them or if you're just being quite honest and saying, hey, I've found this of interest, you might find it of interest as well. And, you know, always be you. Don't try and do fake reviews or fake representation of yourself. It just comes pear-shaped, you know, every time, especially in this day and age when it's easy to trace IP addresses. And, you know, again, similarly, the idea of being transparent, don't offer money, you know, don't try to bribe, don't try to blackmail. If you want to offer someone money, ask if they do sponsored posts, but don't do anything else. And, you know, don't be a pest. You know, if you've sent someone an email and they didn't reply, no harm in sending a tweet to them to say, hi, just checking you got my email. But after that, you know, don't nag. Don't keep harassing them by email. Don't keep harassing them by Twitter. If they didn't respond, perhaps they're not interested. Perhaps it's just not their thing. They're under no obligation whatsoever to come back to you and say thanks very much or no thanks. But in fairness, you know, many journalists are the same as well. So bear that in mind. Looking after bloggers is just A, pretty much the same as looking after any human being, but also just the same as looking after traditional press. You know, give them information that they want, keep them happy, you know, be friendly, you know, be helpful, go the extra mile for them, give them everything they need and then some, and then don't harass them and just let them get on with their job. And similarly, you know, as we've said, you know, all through this, you know, be human, be friendly, you know, not overly, you know, don't start your emails with mate or mucka, you know, but at the same time, you know, you don't have to treat it like dear sir or to whom it may concern, you know, new line and into the body of the text. You quickly get an idea as you deal with people what they like and how they are. And, you know, again, it's this idea of just building up that relationship, building up that honesty, and you know, that, that pays off in the long run. And again, simple tips can be the same as when reaching out to journalists. You know, don't spam them. You know, don't give them extra information. Just give them what they need to make a call on it. Don't harass them. Don't be a pest. So, you know, just consider these things. Consider how, what, what your email inbox. You know, consider how people get in touch with you and what you like. Because the odds are, you know, how people approach you is pretty much, you know, the way you, the way people tr approach you in a good way is the way that you want to be approaching others. But let's have a look at, you know, one company that used blogging quite well recently was Bex. And what they did with it was Bex Canvas. And... This was just a fun idea, you know, with individual labels and it paid off considerably well for them. You know, they achieved over 120 pieces of online coverage, you know, from blogs to the likes of The Guardian and The Times Online. You know, lots of unique views, an equivalent, you know, media value of just over a quarter of a million and a return on investment of nine to one. You know, you can't argue with that in any sense of the word. You know, did they want more? Did they want less? Only Bex can argue that, but most people would look at that and say, well, that that's quite a success there, you know, so so well done all round. Another good little case study to look at is the National Alliance of Childhood Cancer Parent Organisations, which I'll call NACPO for the rest of these slides just to make life easier. And what they did was free entry to uh, Panto as it toured, and basically, you know, the bloggers were in there like the press at the start, you know, they got free tickets, but were asked to make a little donation just so that, you know, to, to the charity, just to make things better. And away the bloggers went, you know, watched the show, wrote reviews, mentioned NACPO, and, you know, nice, simple way of uh, generating some coverage, especially, you know, in a time when less and less journalists go out and cover all the pantos. So this was a nice way of making sure there was some coverage out there. And, you know, Childhood Cancer Parent Organisation is always going to appeal to kiddie bloggers, to parent bloggers. And other, bear in mind, other parent bloggers read other parent blogs. You know, reinforcing this idea of what we said, of, you know, it's a community, there's engagement, there's lots of blogs. So 
for every, I, I would gather that at least for every blogger who went and saw that show and reviewed about it, there was 10 parents reading, a minimum of 10 parents reading each blog going, oh, that's interesting. So, it, you know, it, if the cost of sending these bloggers was a hundred pounds, you know, consider that a case of you know for each one of those there's been ten people coming back, and you know that that's fantastic ticket sales, but even better, it's fantastic awareness raising for NACPO. So it doesn't have to be overly complicated. You know, something like having your press or blog press and bloggers at that is very simply just like a blogger event, and these are no different from having journalist events where you have people along, you give them something to talk about, or you give them something, someone to meet, and the event goes on from there. You know, if anyone's run a press meet, they're very, very similar. You know, it's here's someone to interview, there's your chat, here's some information, here's a product launch, if it's a product launch, the, anything else we can give you, you know, there's some pictures, perhaps a USB memory stick, perhaps a goodie bag, thanks very much, off you go. And again, you know, the bloggers like the press then you hope will go away and write about it, say what they thought, say what they found of the people there, say what they thought of the event. It can pay off very well. And it doesn't need to be overly complicated. Smirnoff did a fantastic blogger meetup in London where the cute twist to it was the fact that, you know, all of the bloggers there had a cocktail named after them. For example, fake plastic noodles received cocktails that had twisted lemon skins in it just to sort of emulate noodles. It was just a nice little touch. You know, Topshop, you know, invited bloggers to a launch party for a Dublin store. London Fashion Week has done very similar things like this. And, you know, there have been people in the past that have said, why would we want to get bloggers involved with something like that? And it's quite simple. You know, if the likes of Burberry can say, hey, come along to our Fashion Week shows, come backstage, we'll even put up four or five iMacs and laptops for you to use so you can write your blog while you're here or you can update online with information as you're here. People love that sort of thing. You know, people appreciate that sort of access. And again, if an event's going well, they're going to jump on quickly and go, oh, here's my thoughts, here's the information, all the best. And you, know, you just can't go wrong with that. I mean, as I say, it's a no-brainer. If, if you've run a press event, you can easily run a blogger event. They're no different, except you know, now in an age of Twitter, they can be reviewed more or less on a real-time basis. And Virgin has done some fantastic things. You know, the, the VJAM Social Media Day was a great way of engaging, you know, and that's expanded out into, you know, not just the blogging community, but into forums and so on, and it's given people a great chance to come to Virgin, say what's good about the brand and what's bad about the brand. And, you know, Virgin do many, many stunts across all social media platforms. But, of course, doing all of this work is only useful if you can actually justify it at the end of the day. You know, while it can be very nice to go to the bank manager and say, well, I've got a blog, you're more likely to get, you know, praise from your boss or something from your bank manager if you can put financial values to things. And some people have always said, well, what do you monitor in a blog? And there's a few things. And, you know, first of all, one good way of monitoring a blog to make life simple for yourself is using RSS. And this stands for really simple syndication where you subscribe to the blog's RSS feed and instead of you know having to go and search the web every day to see what new content there is, the content is sent to you. It's very similar to email in that you say, okay, send my information to me or send this information to me, and it does. And you know, we'll talk a wee bit more here about RSS. This is just to give you examples of how it works. Now think of it like traders have financial feeds, you know, TV subscriptions spoke about email but another example as well is the likes of facebook and twitter you know when you like something or when you follow someone and their stream is sent to you you know their feed of information that's you in essence receiving an rss feed you know you're just receiving it in a very simple way and you know you're not having to go to the twitter page of joe smith for example to always see what joe smith's up to what joe smith's up to appears in your twitter page and why is this good? Why is this useful? Well, RSS makes it easy to monitor a lot of blogs at a time. You know, instead of hunting through a lot of websites, just open up, you know, your RSS reader 
I've, you know, and away you go. You know, any RSS feed you've put in there, which is a simple cut and paste, then you know it will be updated for you. And we'll have a little quick look, a wee bit more at RSS. I mean, if you see that icon anywhere, that's you being told, yep, yeah, you know, there's an RSS feed here. And Google Reader, which is just at google.com slash reader, is the most commonly used one now. Purely because, you know, you can put it in Google and that means you can see it anywhere. But you can then use tools like Net News Wires, which will look at your Google feed, uh, your Google Reader feed, sorry, and then present it in a, another tool. And again, that's, as I say, that's Net News Wire there. And that just shows you very simply to the left hand side all of the feeds that you've got going. You know, to the top, it shows you the top the top blog post that have come in in whatever category you've selected. And on the bottom right is the actual blog post itself. You know, it can be a very simple, very quick way of getting information. You know, and again, you know, you'll find RSS icons all over the place. You know, you, you, wherever you see either the, the, the words RSS in a blue sort of box or the RSS icon, you know, that's it. All you then have to do is go copy link or save link and that's you. Some people will even give you the options just to subscribe. Again, it's not something that's brain surgery. You do it twice and you'll know how to do it. It's not complicated and it's not tricky at all. And, you know, as I've said, you know, it's just like Facebook. But, you know, it's all very well finding all of these blogs and finding all these people to read, engage with and so on. How do you measure, you know, success for yourself? You know, we've spoke about using, you know, authority from technorati and so on to judge how important a blog is for you. At the end of the day, you have to consider for yourself, you know, how do we measure it? How do I turn around and say this blog was important because? And there's a number of tools you can use. You know, at the end of the day, you can have Google Analytics. You can even pay companies to do it. You know, services like FeedBurner will do it too. And depending on the CMS you actually use for your blog, it may have some sort of built-in statistics. Now, bitly.com is one you can use as well. And it's very simple, very straightforward. It can be very useful if you don't have access to Google Analytics or if you don't have Google Analytics embedded. And the way this works, very, very simply, is that it takes a long URL and shortens it down. And we're just going to look here for a moment at White Mackay's Master Blender site. So here we have a blog post. Here we have bit, the Bitly site. And what you can do with Bitly is either cut and paste a normal website URL, you know, the www bit, and put it in to that blue box. Or you can have a plugin set up. As you'll see just under the little house icon to the top left hand side, it says Bitly sidebar. And what that does is very simply lets you, you click your Bitly sidebar option on any web page and it shortens it. It gives you a very shortened link. But what it also does is it will tell you how many people have clicked on your link. And that can at least give you an idea of how popular a page is. And you can see if, you know, that content's successful or if it's not successful. Or you can, you know, again, start to get a feel for what makes it a good post or not. Now, away from Bitly, you also have the option of Google Analytics. Now, Google's options, you know, between AdWords and Analytics and Webmaster Tools, you know, there's a phenomenal amount of data there. A phenomenal amount of data that years ago would have cost a fortune to get. You know, you can tell if it's new visitors that are always coming to your site, if it's recurring visitors coming to your site, you know, which sites are sending them to you. You know, are they coming via Google? Are they coming via Twitter? Are they coming via Facebook? You know, what times of, you know, what, what sort of posts are most popular? You know, what dates people are coming to visit on? You know, that again, this is material that years ago would have been expensive, but is now fantastic. It makes life so much simpler for people writing blogs because you can see what people like. You can see what pages are the most popular. Similarly, you can look at the pages that aren't popular and work on them to improve them for the future. This is just showing you a bit more of the sort of analytics, you know, results that you get. As I say, you know, this is free. If you've got a website at all, you know, you've really no excuse not to have Google Analytics embedded in your main site and also your blog just to make life so much simpler for you. 
because again, you know, one day you might be stuck for a blog idea and go, well, let's have a look in Google Analytics. Oh, that was quite a popular post. Let's do something similar like that. Or you go back a year and go, oh yeah, you know, there's this event coming up again. Let's talk about that like we did last year. And you can mention your own blog post from the past. Ultimately, you, you just can't go wrong with it. You know, it's a fantastic free tool. But again, you know, if you're wanting something else, you know, we've mentioned Technorata Authority, you, know, you can also use Yahoo and links. And ultimately, you'll work out from there, you know, what makes a blog a win for you, you know, what makes a successful blog post, what makes it work. And, you know, there's a lot of ways, you know, we've spoken before about how a blog can be used to increase your sales to support or, you know, support marketing teams as well. And what you want to ask yourself is, you know, questions like, no, is it about the active posts? Is it about the audience reached? Is it about the tone, sentiment? Is it about the number of times our links spread? You know, there's so many things that you can sit and consider to see if it works for you. And you can just sit and go, right, looking at this, you know, we can see the sites that are sending traffic to us. And you can then work out that these are the sites that are good to for you to go and engage with, to leave comments on their sites. Perhaps it's the key bloggers that you should be trying to influence or invite along to your blogger events. But you know, blogging more so than anything else in social media is a great process. You know, it's a very friendly community. It's a very helpful community. And you know, with what you've just been listening to and looking at, you, you've got all the tools there you need to just dive in and start blogging, you know, and have some fun and enjoy yourself while doing it. Because while it is work, you know, engaging and d discussing things with people should also have an element of fun to it to keep it interesting for yourself and also your audience.